Hi, uh, my name is Hayward Paul. I'm an emergency physician. Uh, I've been asked to uh, give a talk on maternal health and how that relates to global emergency medicine. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody for having me here. Um, basically, uh, I'm going to give an overview of, uh, of maternal health, especially uh, issues around maternal mortality, which is a, a high priority in the world. Uh, to all of the health ministries uh, throughout the planet. So, um, and we need to have a, you know, position on this. So let me uh, get this thing queued up correctly. Um, so um, I uh, started an organization called PACE that does work in Mexico and a good part of our work has to do with uh, decreasing maternal mortality. So. I've become sort of an expert of sorts on obstetrics and global emergency medicine. Um, so uh, I'm lately I'm working on the border, uh, doing some uh, global health uh, and and border health initiatives, and we're expecting to do a um, emergency a global emergency medicine fellowship. And if anybody's interested in that, contact me. Um, I've been. Uh, around the block a few times with ASEP and um, with uh, other organizations. Uh, I've been the ambassador to various countries. I was actually director of the ambassador program for a while. Um, and um, and I do some other work as well. Uh, I'm an Ashoka Fellow, which gives me uh, some great contacts to do social impact work. So the uh, learning objectives, I want you to get a feel for what the statistics are like and how the comparisons are between um, countries, of course, the causes of maternal mortality um, and, uh, you know, the indicators and how they are kind of being used and what possible solutions there are. Um, one thing that's really important to think of is that the maternal mortality uh, ratio is really a key performance indicator for the whole healthcare system. Uh, it has so many things that impact it, um, but uh, in general, you'll find that where the maternal mortality rate is low, uh, the uh, care of the healthcare in general is, is high. So like I said, it, it really is um, a, um, a key indicator. And a maternal death is a sentinel event for the entire healthcare system for the same reasons. Now, we're in an unusual spot as global emergency medicine because we're specialists and we train in specialty centers and there's always OB doctors everywhere we are. So in effect, we don't do third uh, trimester pregnancy uh, issues at all in the United States. Now, we go out into the world and want to present ourselves as emergency specialists and we have like over 40 fellowships in, in, in global health and we get there and we know nothing about birthing no babies. <laughs> That's a that's a real issue because uh, the health ministries all over the world sit down and try to figure out what they're going to do and uh, and we have to be at the same table with them and uh, so we don't if we don't have much to offer there then we kind of vote ourselves off the island um, so anyway um, it um, it just um, it's just really important that we uh, are familiar with this topic uh, and so now. What is the effect of a uh, you know global death? Let me see. Um, yeah, I mean it, it's a it's a disaster. You know, I mean basically, obviously, it affects the family. It it uh, you know it undermines the community. The children are at risk. You know, the orphan children and the, they're at risk for all kinds of additional things. And importantly, it destroys the confidence in the healthcare system. So you know, you don't have to have too many deaths in the community before nobody wants to have anything to do with any of the medical people. Uh, so that's a really important concept. The numbers may seem very low, but the effect is tremendous. This is a little bit of an old graph, but it gives you some idea. Uh, in this case, there were 340,000 deaths. Uh, this is back in 2008, but the, the ratios are kind of similar. In this lower right-hand corner, those two black figures represent the developed world, and then the, all the rest is the developing world. And it just so happens that the risk for the average person in the developing world is 14 times higher than the risk of someone in the developed world. Uh, just a couple interesting numbers here. One third of all the deaths are in two countries, uh, India and Nigeria. If you combine those, that's one third of the deaths. Um, but um, so 
uh, you know, we have about 830 women dying every day from uh, from complications, pregnancy, and childbirth. There's been a tremendous decrease in the number. It's decreased 44 percent over 25 years, and so there was a, a pretty remarkable impact. Um, the goal is to get down to less than 70 per hundred thousand live births, um, and um, and it seems to be getting to the point. Where where it's getting harder and harder to reach that. And I'm going to say, unfortunately, the United States uh, is, in some states are above that number already. So that's an interesting thing. We talk about global health, we're going to have to talk about the whole planet. I just want to say something briefly about how the statistics are done. Maternal uh, A um, maternal mortality rate would be the number of deaths uh, uh, over women of reproductive age. But what's typically used is the number of maternal deaths over the number of live births. It's just harder to calculate out all the women of reproductive age, and this has become the standard. Um, and just as an aside, a maternal death um, is a death from any if, from any cause, including uh, incidental things uh, um, that are not directly related to pregnancy. Um, so, um, yeah, so a lot of maternal uh, deaths, a lot of births occur in countries where there's not very good data. So, you know, we're dealing with that part of it. There's about 200 countries in the world and, um, and uh, you know, pretty good number who don't have data at all. Only 65% here show that they have complete data, whatever that is. Um, just a minute. <laughs> so the causes of maternal mortality, I think we know what some of these are. I mean, uh, postpartum hemorrhage, infections, obstructed labor, um, toxemia or uh, eclampsia, and then unsafe abortion. Those are the types of things that we even, you know, could conceivably have to see in an acute setting. There are non-obstetric causes, uh, you know, anemia, other, pre, uh, other associated diseases. Um, let me see. Yep. So, and of course, there's social determinants, and uh, that actually weighs very heavily. Um, and um, you know, some of these are very predictable. I mean, you know, teen pregnancies, and you know, just um, basic uh, education and uh, nutrition, and having maternal services, and so, and, uh, and sanitation. These are all very complicated issues. And um, that's sort of a big rate limiting uh, fact effect. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, let's face it, we actually know how to treat a lot of things, uh, but a lot of people are dying anyway, just because, uh, because of poor infrastructure and various other things. So now what are women uh, dying of? 28%, uh, most of them are dying because they have a pre-existing condition. Uh, diabetes or or something else like that. Um, uh, almost as many are dying from severe bleeding, from postpartum hemorrhage, and from pregnant-induced hypertension and infections. Uh, uh, and um, the timing of the deaths is an uh, uh, interesting point. Uh, about a quarter of them die before they and before they start labor. Um, and uh, then uh, intranatal is 15%, and then postnatal is 60%, and most of those are within the first day. And, and a lot of those are things like uh, infections uh, and, um, and other things. Although you can have um, eclampsia up to six weeks after delivering. So I tried to figure out what the baseline was, you know, before there was any medical care anywhere. And I think it was uh, somewhere around a thousand. I've seen a thousand per hundred thousand, or uh, uh, Afghanistan got to a thousand five hundred per hundred thousand. That's maybe that's closer to whatever it was. Obviously, nobody was doing statistics a few hundred years ago. But um, so now these are the countries with the lowest um, maternal mortality ratios, and three of those countries are actually almost cities. So you know, I mean. You, I mean, technically they're countries, so, but anyway, they appear there. And in any case, all of this is hovering around one or two deaths per 100,000. Um, um, and um, so 
uh, you know, I've taken Afghanistan in around the year 2000 as a as a baseline for how bad it could get, because uh, it was really the worst. It was a, almost 1,500 per 100,000. Um, in the year 2020, it was 223 per 100,000 in the world. In the United States, it's, it's almost 33 deaths per 100,000. And um, uh, that's really terrible. Uh, there are states in the United States that are 82 and 80. Those are way above even the target that World Health Organization has um, for, um, for the year 2030. Uh, so that's pretty, that's pretty bad. So the worst maternal mortality rates are here. Um, they're basically all in Africa except Afghanistan, which, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago was at the very top. Um, so here, and, you know, we talk about global health and we think global health is outside the United States. And, you know, I'm going to have to bring the United States into this whole global health picture. Um, so uh, our maternal mortality rate is now 33. And uh, that happens to be the same mortality rate that Mexico has now. Uh, so uh, that's a bit of a shock to people, but that's a fact. And all these other countries, these are all developed countries and you can see how we compare to those. So we have dismal statistics and it's gotten really bad um, in the last few years. So on the left side, all these countries um, on the left, um, like I was showing you, Mexico is 33. You just saw on the last slide that the United States was 33 as well. So um, people, uh, women in Costa Rica, Barbados, Uruguay, Chile have a better chance of surviving than in the United States on average, okay? At the right, you can see here we got Mississippi at 82. And, and that's right about the average of all of Latin America. So, and then all of these countries, uh, that you see on this list, if you are if if you are from Mississippi, uh, and is and a lot of this has to do with the population being largely Afro American, uh, you're much better off having um, a baby in anywhere else in in the Western Hemisphere. That's pretty sad, right? So uh, again, in the United States, uh, black mothers are three times more likely to have a bad outcome than white moms. Uh, there's been a 44% increase in in birth and uh, deaths among Afro-Americans in just one year. And, oh, sorry, that's Hispanics. And uh, then uh, Native Americans, likewise, 50% increase. Um, so what's it take to fix these things? Well, a lot of political will uh, and commitment, uh, you know, trying to avoid a pregnancy altogether is probably the best, uh, you know, prevention is the best medicine. Um, and then you need strong healthcare systems and, and access and accountability and all of those things. And those are um, not the easiest things to pull off in a lot of situations. Um, you know, it's a very comprehensive plan to take care of people during pregnancy. Um, but there's clearly you need to have access to health care for everybody and as much education and uh, contraception uh, as possible. Um, and uh, and then C-sections are a particular hazard. If where there's more C-sections, there's more mort mortality rate. When it, I should say when there's more than what would be the average, there's a certain number of C-sections that are absolutely required, right? But a lot of times they're done at least in developed worlds or people who have more money, they, they, uh, it's done at, for convenience sake. Um, I, this slide is old, but I would like to point this out. I mean, we have this idea that how much we spend um, has an impact on healthcare. And uh, this shows the, how much, to, what the um, average life expectancy is versus how much is being spent. And, and believe me, this is quite old, but the chart still kind of looks the same. Instead of $4,500 per man, woman, and child in the United States, we're up to somewhere around 12,000. But, uh, you know, Cuba and the United States have similar uh, uh, life expectancy rates, and uh, but the disparity in cost is tremendous. Okay, so, you know, a lot of the deliveries are going to be routine deliveries. You know, 95% of those are really completely 
um, without any complication. Somewhere around 5% have some complication or another. Um, uh, there's come out over time this uh, analysis of the uh, of the delays, critical delays of care. And one is recognizing that there's a problem. Uh, and, uh, and then the second, and being able to activate a system to move the patient. The second is how to transport the patient. And the third is at the referral facility, what's missing, what's there, what's, what's not. And, and it's a, often a combination of those three things. All the stuff on the left is the kinds of things that you're, you know, we're looking at as far as uh, prenatal care and and watching it for various um, problems and stuff. And the stuff on the right is really the more immediate stuff that happens during uh, actual birth, you know, during labor, postpartum hemorrhage, sepsis, hypertensive disorders, obstructed labor. Um, the facilities really have to have all of the things needed to make uh, those things happen and a lot of places don't and uh and like for instance blood is something that's going to be very difficult but even more simple things um like we found when we were working in Oaxaca that they would not use mag sulfate so the focus is on um at least during birth is uh hemorrhage and bleeding um uh prevention you know as the use of oxytocin or those types of drugs are uh, encouraged. And uh, preeclampsia is, uh, is another big one, um, obviously. And, uh, and then having a, a trained uh, health care providers uh, who can help, right? I just want to talk about Mexico a bit because this is where I've been working the most. Um, there's about 300,000 doctors that are working uh, in Mexico. Um, and about 15% of them have uh, residency training. So 80, 85% are general practitioners, no residency program in anything. And some of these things, what they're showing is like half the doctors are in six states out of you know 30. Um, uh, vast majority are urban. And, uh, and there's actually a good number of doctors who are not even licensed. So, um, and this is a big problem. This is Oaxaca, uh, you know, People were having postpartum hemorrhage, and they were traveling twelve hours to get to uh, to the main hospital. And uh, obviously, that's a, those are lethal distances. And uh, the big problem here is that uh, people do not know how to recognize a problem early, and in some cases, resolve it early uh, on the spot rather than try to send them without uh, any care at all. And so, we stumbled across this um, course. 20 years ago, uh, Advanced Life Support for Obstetrics, and it's an emergency obstetrics course uh, that was designed by the family medicine in order for them to be able to uh, deliver babies in U.S. hospitals. They need a certification. So we've adopted and adapted this course to function in Mexico, and uh, it was brought to us by a med Spanish student. We have a medical Spanish program, uh, so you guys are welcome to come down and contact me on that as well. <laughs> in my little plug here. Um, and we started this in 2006. Um, and we've uh, piloted a basic life support for obstetrics course. That course has uh, been in India. They've trained 40,000 people there in that course. But this was our first class of people in 2006. Um, we have trained, PACE has trained around 57,000 people, uh, and 21,000 have been in emergency obstetrics, another 20,000 in the more routine uh, American heart type courses. Uh, so we've done a lot of training. We're actually kind of a gold standard here in Mexico for that. And we've worked on at community levels to try to deal with the whole chain of um, chain of survival in terms of uh, obstetrics. Um, and the course is very similar to an ATLS course, uh, but it focuses on, on those things that are deadly to, to women in birth. And we also sometimes have workshops in kind of neonatal resuscitation that are uh, related. We, we brought this um, vacuum um, aspirator that's used instead of the uh, forceps to Mexico and showed 20,000 people how to use it. And that's those, that's a big improvement. So that we use mnemonics and, um, and uh, we do a, a lot of the, uh, the simulation and then evaluation certification. You're familiar with these kinds of courses. Um, this is an area where emergency medicine 
helps a lot just because of the way we could have gone about doing some of these things. I mentioned the helping babies breathe part is also kind of the baby's first breaths out there um, in, when they're in remote areas. Uh, we become a center for excellence in, in the world for this. Um, the whole program became part of the national strategy to decrease maternal mortality in Mexico. Um, and uh, we've actually been able to be, get into uh, public, into um, uh, official guidelines in healthcare in a variety of areas in emergency care, including emergency obstetrics. And then we've had a few big events, um, forums uh, for Latin America. And uh, Dr. Tintinelli is one of our biggest fans, and she became an also instructor, and some of her residents became also instructors. And uh, so uh, we've really uh, pushed the um, emergency obstetrics part of this. And this was at our conference. This is the Undersecretary of Health and directors of various uh, programs, uh, director of epidemiology, director of maternal health, and a couple of different uh, uh, health uh, ministers. Um, and so, you know, we've had these kinds of meetings where we train the trainers and uh, kind of publicize this and promote the, the course. So I just wanted to look at this, uh, what it is, the key care components from an emergency medicine point of view. Um, uh, you know, pushing a, a maternal health and decreasing maternal mortality, like I said, actually helps the whole system because it involves a lot of uh, a lot of things tangibles and intangibles that that make a very big difference in people's lives but it, obviously if you have a very good system for handling um uh births you have like you can manage postpartum hemorrhage that's that's managing blood products you have to start ivs you know you there's medications that are used for blood pressure there's magnesium there's the seizure medicines that can that we have to use, um, you know, eclampsia be, and, and uh, you know, airway if they're seizing, uh, infection control, sepsis prevention, the whole healthcare system integration, and the OB fast with the uh, ultrasound, and um, and then there's specific training for obstructed labor, shoulder dystocias, breaches, and those kinds of things. But you can see that uh, all of these things, if they're working well, implies that we have a good. A, a pretty decent emergency care system, period. So there's a lot of reason to really push on that. So your, some of my takeaways, maternal health is a central consideration in global health, so we can't ignore it. Uh, and so it's awkward if we're out there pretending to be emergency specialists and don't know anything about that. Um, like I said, it's a key performance indicator. Um, it, and uh, death is a sentinel event. Um, the Maternal health in the United States is increasingly an important problem. We are deep into the developing countries. We, we, uh, we're just really far into the weeds with this and uh, it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, uh, we don't have, uh, we're not well equipped in emergency medicine as specialists to do this kind of work. Um, but if you're going to do global health work, you need to be able to sit at the table with the people who do public health. And so we really need to know this. I'm going to show you this um, video that we, it's of our project in Chiapas. In rural and indigenous areas of Latin America, such as Chiapas, Mexico, there is a persistent state of emergency in the area of women's health and obstetrics. In remote, impoverished, and politically marginalized areas, there is a high infant mother mortality because the healthcare system does not extend well into these areas. Ooh, sorry. Births are attended by local midwives who rely on traditional knowledge and personal experience. Some government health authorities disapprove. But the reality is that these traditional birth attendants are the ones delivering babies and keeping the mothers alive. They are the only hands available. PACE Certified Obstetrical First Responder Program is a way to reduce infant mother mortality by training traditional midwives with the latest medical techniques and creating a link of communication and respect with the medical authorities so that midwives can transfer emergency cases to higher levels of care with enough time to save lives. PACE is a dynamic organization dedicated to improving medical care in emergencies in Mexico and Latin America. PACE has trained 10,000 doctors and nurses in ALSO, 
Advanced Life Support for Obstetrics. They're the only provider of this gold standard course in Mexico. Not only does PACE offer training in cutting edge life-saving techniques, but they are constantly innovating methods of adult education using hands-on simulation to overcome linguistic and cultural barriers. PACE turns experimental learning techniques into proven training programs. The PACE Obstetrical First Responder Program is a new concept focusing on the last kilometer of care. In inaccessible rural areas, women with postnatal hemorrhaging may travel for hours to receive adequate emergency medical care. Far too often, they die before reaching a hospital. If they do make it to an emergency room, precious time is lost as doctors must reevaluate and diagnose the problem. PACE's solution covers three areas. Training for traditional birth attendants, midwives with scientifically sound practices and clinical methods, giving them options they do not already have, such as simple pharmaceuticals, early diagnosis of emergencies, and how to communicate with the rest of the healthcare system. Testing and certification of certified obstetrical first responders so that doctors and medical authorities will better integrate with the traditional birth attendants and community health workers so that they can work as a team to save lives. Create an M Health emergency obstetric communication system so that obstetrical first responders can report an emergency using basic SMS. Hospitals will be informed of incoming patients and a record will be created of the emergency and treatment that is continuous throughout the different levels of medical care. PACE will set up a pilot program in Chiapas, Mexico, where we are already established as leaders in community health and relied on by government healthcare providers for high-level training. Progress will be documented and monitored by an mHealth dashboard with measurable indicators, number of deaths, number of emergencies and near misses, number and type of medical interventions. This information can be used to fine tune and improve the system. By seeing better coordination along the chain of survival, the number of deaths and complications will go down and successful interventions will go up. This will provide concrete proof that the program is working and ready to be implemented in other regions. With our innovative certification system, the best technology and instructors, and our philosophy of community-based training, we will bring the most advanced techniques to the most isolated healthcare providers. PACE, training for medical emergencies without boundaries. So, um, yeah, so that's basically uh, the presentation. Um, uh, I think uh, this is going to be a great series. Uh, I suppose we'll have more uh, lectures like this and uh, sort of have a library of, of, of potential options for global health curriculum. And uh, and uh, it's uh, I think that uh, working in the year of global health is uh, is very satisfying and uh, it's important. It, it provides a lot of things that help us uh, get around burnout and various other things and provides meaning for many of us. And so uh, I encourage you to consider that kind of work in, in part or in total, however you can imagine. And if you need any uh, advice on things or if you're interested in working with us in some way, um, uh, well, then I'll just give just contact me and uh, thanks for uh, thanks for having us. Uh, take care. That's it. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Listo. Listo.